Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a weird hybrid of computer science, social science, and information science these days, and now director of research for the new Center for Research in Equitable and Open Scholarship right here at MIT, hosted in the libraries. So before I go into the meat of this talk and talk about what District Builder is and what it does, we need to, to give attribution. This would not have been possible without a whole lot of support from a whole lot of people. Uh, Michael McDonald, who's been my, my long-term collaborator, who's the PI on this project, and, um, and Robert, Robert Cheatham at Azavia, who's been a collaborator on all the, the phases of, of implementation and deployment, and all of our, our funders uh, and sponsors, especially the, the Sloan Foundation, which has, uh, has supported us for, for a long time on this. And then there's the disclaimer. If if you like anything in this talk, all credit to all of those folks. If you don't like anything, I got it wrong, I had a typo, I miscommunicated. They didn't review these slides and approve, approve them, so they can only be blamed for things that are published with their names on them. And that's probably my fault, too. So why does redistricting matter? Well, a number of reasons. One. It affects who controls government. So usually, you know, every, every election we go out and we vote for uh, who we want to represent us. Uh, but every 10 years or so, uh, those politicians draw maps and, in a way, decide who they want to vote for them. Or, have the opportunity to vote for them. And as a result, there is some manipulation and some bias. Uh, an example is that in 2012, Democratic candidates to the House received 1.4 million more votes than Republican candidates. Republicans won 234 to 201 seats. This is a result of geography and demography interacting. Not all of it is attributable to intentional manipulation for partisan purposes, but a fair amount of that is because some party wanted it that way. We can do better. In many places, district lines are also drawn with the purpose to reduce minority representation. Happens in North happened in North Carolina, Texas, and Virginia, part because minority representation aligns with partisanship in different ways, and part because there is a history of, of minority uh, su vote suppression and, and electoral suppression in this country. And finally, this process leads to and is a result of polarization. So gerrymandering is driven by partisanship, by generally by, by attempting to get partisan advantage. And it contributes to polarization. And so it's not, it's not the whole story, nor, nor really the mo most of the story of polarization. But it contributes to this vicious cycle. So how do you gerrymander? Well, you follow the example of the, the Elbridge Gerry, who was a governor in this fair state of Massachusetts, choose, um, choose areas of geography to, that will have the voting results you want. Um, and this is, um, this is, you know, happens all over, not just in, um, not just in, in Jerry's times. Um, and you doesn't require a computer. Um, districts have been created on maps with crayons and paper, uh, paper and magic markers and transparencies, and now we do them with computers, but there's nothing special. For example, suppose you have an ideal state. 
it's square. Or, or you can consider drawing a state on the surface of a spherical chicken, if you like. Um, you, you want it even more ideal in, in, in a vacuum. Um, we see that there are, are 20 members of the pale party and 16 members of the blue party. Um, we're going, but we, we have different ways we could divide this. Um, we could arrange it so that one, the, the blue party gets one, or maybe none. <laughs> we could probably also figure out other arrangements. Well, that's a simple, um, simple example. The, more, the general example is very complicated. Very, very complicated. Actually, it's, it's in, incalculably complicated. It's the number of, of ways that you can divide a map into districts uh, grows exponentially in the number of pieces you have to divide in census blocks. And it's also solving this for even simple things like keeping population balanced and keeping, keeping the, the districts contiguous turns out to be MP hard. Doesn't mean we can't do it, but the, finding the optimal solution is not generally tractable unless you know p equals np. Uh, does that mean that n equals one? But I, I think that's and it's there's also there's also a philosophical quandary, which is that redistricting is intentionally deciding where to put put people to maximize representation. If we wanted to eliminate manipulation, we could, uh, for example, just randomly assign people to districts. If we did that, there would be a, a large majority bonus because 50% plus epsilon would be a complete sweep. And um, they probably wouldn't have much connection with your local representative. Uh, so we've decided that a geographical system with human human choice to identify communities, to match representation to, to communities, and, and how and demography makes sense. But we don't have a strict definition of what representation is and how much each one gets. And it doesn't come back. And, and, and astonishingly, representation usually doesn't equal looking great on a map, necessarily. So it's not just a visual thing. Well, this is an illustration of a number of redistricting plans possible. So what is our, what was our proposed solution? Well, we are not solving the representation problem. We are solving the legitimacy problem. Right? That, that, not that there is a human in the loop, but that it is done in back rooms, that it is opaque, that it is manipulated by a small group of, of partisans. And the theory behind how to solve that was to go from legalese. These are the requirements in the particular state, not Massachusetts. I think it's uh, Colorado. Uh, part of the requirements for drawing a district. Um, there's also you know, other other requirements, like the population has to be in congressional districts has to be exactly the same. Well, maybe with a difference of like three. Not, not 3%, three people. Which, of course, is a statistical absurdity, but because populations change over time. But it is part of the law that there be the minimus quality and that you get all of the 100,000 blocks next to each other and that you don't leave out one and you follow the legal rules for contiguity that might, might mean that if there's a bridge there but they don't touch, it's contiguous or something else. So there are a lot of rules. And in the past, it's been really difficult for non-professional politicians to create plans that were just past the legal bar. So in the 2000 era, um, looked at a few of these. Maybe we could find half a dozen. There might have been more uh, plans that were submitted by other than partisans. Um, even things from like League of Women Voters got, got, some of those got kicked out because they missed empty zero population blocks. So we wanted to take these legal requirements and translate it into something so simple that you could drag, click, drag, and then visualize when you got to a legal plan. 
and then click on the submit button. This is not just a matter of software. It's a matter software is a tool. Data is absolutely necessary. You can't have, you can't have a legal plan without the official data and the, the official data in the right way. And you can't understand the consequences of a particular plan. And a, and a redistricting plan is a policy proposal in the form of a map. With, you can't understand the consequences without access to a lot of other data, like voter registration, which may not be part of the, the official redistricting data, but is necessary to understand the, the consequences. Education is it. People need to know that these services are available, that it's important to become engaged, and dissemination engagement. But we focused on the software, which right now looks sort of like this. Uh, you, can, you can see that it has some, some tools for viewing, for editing, for evaluating districts. We'll drill into that. Um, so the front of the tool is a website, and it's, this tool is designed so that different organizations can put up their own, um, their own instances, and they have. So uh, we've run redistricting or supported redistricting campaigns across the country uh, and different good government organizations like Common Cause have hosted sites. Uh, and they have, they may put on their own branding, control their own instance. When you enter the system, a single site can support multiple contests. So you might have within a particular state, for example, congressional races, state house races, local races. So you can, the data for those is shared, but you can drill in to a particular set of contests and view existing plans or and drill in to get details or, or sign up and create plans on your own. Um, when you create a plan, you create it by selecting, selecting population units. You get more detail as you zoom in. So you might see counties at first and then zoom in and see block groups, et cetera. You select a bunch of those. You can drag them over to a different district. And the scores change. So you can see how you're doing with official criteria. You can also see more detailed reports. And going back to this, you can get a visual overview of how well you're doing. So in this, the, this view, these small boundaries represent units of population. The dark ones have a lot. So they're census tracts. The dark ones have a lot of population. The orange boundaries are districts. This district has too few people. It's blue. This district has too many people. It's orange. If we start dragging some dark colored census tracts from the blue to orange, they'll turn clear and we're getting close to a solution. Then we'd have to drill in to the precise scores to the report. And finally, when we submit the plan, it will run a set of checks to see that it meets the legal criteria for a plan and let you know if it doesn't. But most of that legalese problem has been turned into a visualization problem. And so we've had 10-year-olds uh, who have submitted legal plans, like in Ohio, legal plan for the Ohio legislature that, that, that did better on most criteria, that, uh, well, uh, actually did better on all criteria <laughs> than, uh, than the official plan. Well, you can spread this. So I'll talk a little bit about how District Builder was built, but not too much into the technical, technical details. I'm a scientist these days, not a software engineer. Um, that the, 
The theory is that it's imagined by scientists, uh, or political scientists, social scientists, information scientists, and we have some, um, some views on how information and communication technology can enhance participation in government and how, how that can happen through designing interfaces that make hard problems more simple by translating them into to different kinds of problems. We, uh, but, but this is supposed to be built for, for the public who have actual specific needs for things like data and, what, and, and the types of bandwidth they have, the situations which they want to access things. And so part of the uh, formulation of this was to develop a set of, of design principles for transparency and participation through some think tanks endorsed um, good government groups, and to use those to guide the implementation, the engineering. And that was done by professionals. Xavia, which is a uh, B Corp and has been um, developing open source free software for, for decades now, specializing in geospatial web applications. And they have partnered on, um, on all of the, the development of the, the deployed systems. And then the deployment can, they may be supported by professionals, maybe through the cloud. Can, you can pop up an instance in Amazon after it's configured and set up. And of course, we, to do this, we stand on the shoulders of many others in the open source, the free software community. Uh, from, from running on Linux, uh, we, we've been deploying on Ubuntu, that of course can run on, uh, on other Linux stacks. Postgres SQL and PostGIS have been really important. Um, R, the R software package, uh, software language was used for some of the more complex analyses, though it's, it's optional. GeoServer, GeoDjango, frameworks, an open layer on the, on the front end. Um, this gives you an idea of the evolution of the software where we're going. That stack might, um, we adopted in 2010. Uh, so 2005 to 2010, we were doing experiments and design principles. We wrote some expert software in R, did the first release using that stack in, in 2010, 2013 for the congressional redistricting that was happening during that time. Um, because redistricting is episodic, it gets a lot less use in the, in the interval, and we accumulated quite a bit of technical debt. So there was a refresh um, that was completed for the, at the, the end of this year for the uh, Pennsylvania contest. Uh, and we're looking to the future, depends on what resources are available from, from good government groups and foundations from the community. But to move to not only being able to deploy in the cloud, but to scale across the cloud to use APIs for everything, including having central repositories of open data that rather than having people need to you know, go to different places and gather it and, and install it in each instance, support for international deployment, support for modern map rendering, for enhanced collaboration. We have some abilities for people not only to, uh, thank you, to create a districting, districting plan, but to identify where their local community is. Say, this is, this is my neighborhood, and I want you to, uh, I want you to not split it up, uh, and to, to take that, neighborhood, publish it, and enable uh, it to be used as a benchmark for other plans. So a congressional plan could then just be measured against that neighborhood. But that's a basic functionality, and there's not a lot of other functionality for collaborating across plan generation, sharing it, annotating, commenting. And finally, uh, there's been a lot of progress in automated redistricting, and although we, we don't see this as a, a solution to what to draw, if you have, if, if you've identified where communities are, the core outlines of your district, some of the 
criteria that you are attempting to, to maximize, then this could be used for, for computer-assisted map refinement. So where has District been, Builder been used? Well, right now it's being used in Pennsylvania um, around the, the court-ordered redistricting there. It's part of public redistricting and uh, um, public competitions supported by, by good government groups. Uh, it's also been used in 10 states where there were more than 1,000 legal plans created by the public, thousands of public participants, millions of, of viewers. Uh, this included student competitions. There's been some, this is an example of it working in for a Mexican redistrict and there were some research prototypes where Mexican grad students were using it to create alternatives there. Uh, how has it made a difference? Well, we can point at the local and the, the broad level. Um, it's easier to, to identify local changes. The broad level is more speculative. Uh, but these are two people who, um, who are now representatives. Um, and this was picked up in Minneapolis and used for city county redistricting. Uh, and in fact, the uh, Somalian Latino community groups not only created plans, but they identified their neighborhoods. Right? And so as a result, these got adopted, and you can see the changes in, in wards before and after. And the first, um, this is the, the, the highest uh, office uh, a Somali has held, and uh, Somali American has held so far. Um, we, you can also use this to look at uh, plans from different redistricting efforts and competitions. And we can see that the public creates different maps than, um, than the legislature. Uh, here's, a, here's a set of good government criteria, uh, an example of one set of, of maps, I think it's from uh, Florida. These were, or uh, no, uh, oh, Ohio. Sorry. Um, up and to the right is better. <laughs> the legislative plan. It's always down here. Why? Because it turns out they're trying to, they're they're trying to do the best they can on all these other criteria, while conditioned on getting as many seats as possible. And you can do some other revealed preference analysis to, to show that. But the public plans show that there's a lot more, there's a lot more possibilities out there. Um, and may also be useful for evidence in, in, in litigation later. Open government is not an on-off switch. This is part of a, of a ladder to participation. Um, it starts with understanding that you have a right and being included in information gathering, going to awareness, uh, to, to direct engagement. But for the most part, redistricting has not involved decision making. So most of the, we've, using this software, we've, and others have been successful in moving from moving to more awareness and moving some to more direct participation. And sometimes that has affected the process. Sometimes those have been adopted directly, like in the city council, which is less partisan. Sometimes the courts have taken notice. So how do we learn more? Uh, there's a instance now, draw the lines PA. You can you can take a look at it running there. There's an open, open book, open access text. Um, and the source is available from GitHub under an Apache 2 license. So arguments, questions, observations. to here in queue, that would be great. If you can't come uh, up for it, I'll have a mic and I'll be carrying that around as well. So just raise your hand if you can. Hi, 
Great talk, thank you. Howdy, stranger. Hi. <laughs> um, you mentioned minority representation is being reduced in places like North Carolina, Texas, Virginia. And so I'm sort of wondering um, what people there, how they feel about this tool you've built. Are, are you upsetting people? <laughs> um, are, are they embracing w the tool? Well, so there uh, it was not, talk just to be clear, I'm not talking about overall trends in minority access. It's always been, uh, been threatened in this, this country, and there's always been forces that are not just uh, trying to maximize partisan advantage, but sometimes trying to diminish minority representation. Uh, so sometimes this is seen as a, a tool for empowerment, because it does enable individuals to uh, participate, to make proposals where maybe they, they, weren't they weren't able to before to share information about their, their neighborhoods. We've seen it successful in places. It can also, there can also be resistance if, um, for example, there are, uh, good government groups, representatives of, of particular communities, and they have a specific plan that they would like to put forward. All right? That may be in tension with having lots of public plans. So we found both you know, encouragement in general, but also sometimes specific concerns that having a, having a large group of public submissions dilutes particular message. And that's not, that's not exclusive to, to uh, minority community groups. I've had that for all sorts of, all sorts of uh, other groups with political, uh, uh, political perspectives. That even though they may, may favor good government, they may uh, find you know, a, a, a large scale crowd participation a little much to communicate and to, to analyze. What are the inputs that you're considering when uh, determining the partisan lean of a district? Is that registered voters? Is that past turnout? Um, yeah, so um, I'm talking about several layers. Um, the, the system itself allows you to have data in and to create calculators and, and generate scores from them and map those to legal criteria. So to some extent, it is, it is dependent on the particular institution that is hosting the site, how to represent those, those scores and predictions. What we, what we recommend generally is registration data because that's available, often normalized with the uh, normal historical vote and turnout district. Um, and that gives, uh, that gives a fairly good prediction of the uh, expected uh, composition of a, of a district. And in this case, a 4% uh, uh, is often considered a competitive range. And outside of a 4% difference is considered, uh, except in more unusual circumstances, uh, a partisan district, though the numbers vary from, from competition to competition. In some cases, it might be as much as 10% as where you have some, some chance of competition. Uh, but there are lots of ways that you can, you can calculate these, including regression, uh, regression models and maximum likelihood. And um, you're not limited to the, you know, the, to the simple calculations that we have in there by default. I, I live in Pennsylvania, so thank you very much for. <laughs> sure, Dan. Um, uh, really, thanks to the committee of seventy and to all of those, we we just created the software initially. That's right, but it, it seemed like a intractable problem for a long time, and I think this was something that unlocked it. I mean, I'm not that close to the process, but from the outside, I guess I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship you see to the kind of work you're doing and sort of the open data movement in general, and then if you 
like where you see the value of free software in those areas? Sure. Um, I think there was a relevant slide here. Uh, so software, software is a tool, uh, and the uh, the open software, the free software, has two advantages as a tool. One is that it's available for communities to use, um, and for communities that don't necessarily have a lot of resources to use, it lowers some of those barriers. Uh, the other is it is transparent in important ways. So when you're using it in a political process, you can see what decisions are made and how they're implemented and, and can test them. So if you decide that you don't think our formula for, uh, for our default formula for calculating partisan advantage is a good one, you can both see, see that we actually use the formula we said we did and also substitute something else. Uh, none of this works without having information. All right. if, you don't, if you don't have the right data to draw the map, you can draw a map of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood or Sesame Street as, as per the previous article, um, but not of Massachusetts. And if you don't have the official data, you can't get past the post in, in entering that policy conversation. If you don't have a legal pol plan, you can't join that that policy conversation. Uh, and if you don't have, if all you have is the minimal data, say population and lines, it's, you can't make meaningful predictions about the consequences of the plan. So you need rich, open, recognized, vetted, and, and, and some you know, certified data. Um, and uh, the you know, side note, uh, data for the bare bones of redistricting from the census, it's made available from the, the census. It's, it's, it's accessible, open, though getting it into a form that is useful for this process is a value add and that helps, software helps. Um, information about the electoral process, voting, registration, et cetera, that is much more inconsistent over the state and often like not, not available. In, in public forums. So there's a huge need to make electoral data in general, uh, how we run our elections, how we vote, available in a standard way, in an open way. And then public education and, and dissemination connections without having uh, League of Women Voters or, or um, Common Cause or other citizens groups on the ground engaging, this would be a you know, site nobody would use. So you need a combination of that, that engagement, the data, and the, and the software. Thank you. I'm interested in the dismal voting records that we see in the country in many elections, uh, particularly the local elections that uh, uh, for something like bond issues and mayors and stuff. Uh, do you see a connection between solving these redistricting problems and increased voter participation? Do people feel that their vote matters more because the districts have become more fair? So voter, voter turnout is, uh, is a much, is a big question. There are a lot of causes for that. I see that redistricting is part of the story of contributing to polarization, um, and that, and and so reducing meaningful choice. Uh, and so, I don't think that's the, the the entire story on on polarization, and I don't think that having you know meaningful choices is the entire story on on turnout either. But uh, but I I think that it is a, a part of the problem. Um, so the, uh, when the public submits and creates submits maps, um, do those usually feature more or fewer majority minority districts than the ones that are put together by uh, parties? 
so when uh, in the in the analysis that we did, um, often the and the recall that the hosting institution sets up the you know the score criteria and indicators. So there's a there's a lot of framing going on there, but there were generally the same number of majority and minority districts, uh, and it varies from state to state. Um, but uh, the public plans did better on partisanship, on compactness, uh, on competitiveness, and other other criteria while maintaining that number of, of majority minority districts, which are generally um, was generally clear how many you could you could make um, in that in a particular case. Uh, there are you know that's at the congressional level because most of the analysis was at the congressional level. And there's less, uh, there's less play there. Uh, we did see, like in you know, the example I showed in Minnesota, where uh, having a community process allowed there to be the information necessary to get more minority, majority uh, districts. Um, and then also, there, in terms of competitiveness, uh, this was a controversy with um, mm -hmm. the redistricting commission that was uh, uh, going to be set up in New Jersey, yeah. where it's sort of um, a balance between uh, trying to find an optimal, um, an optimally competitive districts across the board versus uh, the like the underlying partisanship of the state writ large. Sure, you know if it's like if it's 70-30 Democrat, you can't really. Well, well there, there, you know, geography constrains things. Uh, Population constrains things, and also math constrains things. So, if you look at some like work in political science in the in the seventies, if you want you want to maximize the number of, of competitive districts in a range, you can't maximize the the overall fairness of the electoral curve. Right? If you want to maximize that and responsiveness, you you've got to choose among what look like all good. Good criteria, and part of this is we don't know how to how to calculate good representation down to the you know the third significant different digit. So there's always a, a trade-off among these criteria. Question? Are there any other questions? If if not, then let's thank our speaker again. And thank you for coming. Thanks for the opportunity. And go in there, go out there, and, and try.